Uh, thank you for coming out this Wednesday morning. Uh, I'm Denny Doherty, the first vice president of the Institute. Uh, our president, Martin Blackwell, is, is off in Cleveland and Pittsburgh and other places that uh, need more conservative influence. Uh, we are uh, at your place at the table. Uh, you should find, among other things, a schedule of the Leadership Institute schools that are coming up. Uh, as well as a uh, brochure on the 4th of Ju July soiree. Uh, this 4th of July proves to be uh, even better than, than uh, usual uh, with former Congressman Jim Rogan uh, as, our, as our speaker. Uh, Jim is now has full time uh, free from the Congress to uh, prepare his remarks and uh, I'm sure they're going to be outstanding ones. Uh, I hope the uh, young folks in our crowd uh, realize the significance of today. Uh, today we uh, remember the uh, D-Day uh, when Americans uh, returned to Europe, uh, to the land of many of our ancestors, to reclaim uh, that continent for Western civilization, uh, similar to the, uh, uh, the work that we try to do in the realm of ideas, uh, saving the ideas of Western civilization. Uh, I wondered if, if might, we might not uh, start off this morning by recognizing if there are veterans among us, folks who have worn the uniform of our country, if they could uh, stand up and take well-deserved recognition. Thank you. Uh, up, here in, up here in the front with the fancy name tag is a fellow who, this is the first Wednesday that uh, Scott Lingenfelter hasn't worn his uniform on a Wednesday morning. Uh, he just uh, left the Army with the idea of uh, changing the realm of his public service uh, from the military to the legislature of Virginia. And Scott started off his campaign in, in, in a very salutary uh, manner. He hired a graduate of the Campaign Management School of the Leadership Institute. Uh, and uh, that school is coming up next week. So if you uh, know anyone who uh, has aspirations for office, uh, we'd recommend that uh, to you highly. Uh, uh, Scott uh, hopefully invited you to his, his, his uh, kickoff at the VFW today uh, for his uh, campaign. It's my pleasure now to call upon uh, Jenny Piccolo of the Leadership Institute uh, staff for the prayer and, and Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, Jenny just completed her internship here at the Leadership Institute in the Center for uh, Print and Broadcast Media, uh, and is currently an intern with the National Desk at uh, the Washington Times, uh, for which many of us are most grateful. She is the recipient of a Balance in Media Fellowship and graduates in December with plans to continue uh, in the field of journalism. Uh, Jenny Piccolo. Would you pray with me, please? Dear God, uh, thank you for the safety and traveling and uh, that everyone could be here this morning. Lord, I ask that you would uh, direct singers' remarks and that we would learn from them. Lord, I pray that, uh, that you would guide us in our country um, and forgive us for things that we are letting slip through the loopholes. Lord, I ask that you would guide our president to make decisions uh, that you approve. And Lord, I thank you for our freedom. And it was hard sought and um, delivered by you. Thank you for all your many gifts. Amen. Um, would you pledge allegiance with me? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands. One nation, God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Jenny. Uh, it's now my pleasure to, to introduce to you Victoria Morgan, uh, who regulars at the uh, Wake Up uh, Brevis or, uh, have uh, seen before. Victoria graduated from the University of Central Florida, is in her second year here at the Leadership Institute. She coordinated last year's Conservative Leadership Conference, uh, the most successful in its history, and is currently planning the 30th anniversary Conservative Soiree, which I suspect is her reason for coming to the mic. Good morning, everybody. I am here to uh, invite you to the soiree. Oh, 
Okay, this is the 30th annual 4th of July, the National Conservative 4th of July Sporey. I am so excited about it. We're going to have a great time this year. And I want to make sure that everyone comes out for the soiree. Where Fort Hunt Park, which is um, by Mount Vernon, and when it's going to be 4th of July, from 12 to 5 p.m. We will provide the following for free. Roast pig, a lot of pork. Have a good time with the pork. <laughs> beer and soft drinks. For the first time, we're going to have a beer truck out there for those of you who want to drink the beer. A Dixieland band, Warren's favorite. Conservative Olympics, where a lot of organizations come and compete with each other and also children this year. A clown for the kids. And much, much more. I'm excited about it. Are you excited about it? We're getting started. All right. The speaker this year will be the Honorable Jim Brogan. Yes, we're so happy to have him. He explained a little bit about him before. And we have a lot of sponsors this year. This is just our grand patron sponsors. And um, in your flyer, we also have them listed right here for you. We have another group of sponsors also. About 50 sponsors this year, and this is a perfect time for you to go ahead and mingle with each other, and we can go ahead and come together as a group and just find out more about each other, and we can network. So please come out. Last year we had 1,312 show up. We want to see your face in the place this time. For more information, you can contact me here, 703-247-2000, or on the World Wide Web at leadershipinstitute.org. Once again, love to see you there. I'm excited about it. Get excited about it. See you 4th of July. Thank you. Always good to see Victoria's face. Uh, now, for purposes of introducing our speaker, who I found used to work at the place where I had the misfortune to still be, uh, uh, is... Uh, is Adam uh, Bittner, a intern with the School and Facilities Department here at the Leadership Institute. Uh, Adam comes from Dallas, Texas, uh, and will return in the fall to complete his senior year at the University of Texas in Austin. His major is Communications and Government. Uh, Adam was recruited by the leadership, Campus Leadership Program in his junior year, a uh, sophomore year, excuse me, and has attended a youth leadership school, the Grassroots Activist School, and a direct male school, which I'm sure he'll be able to be happy to tell you something about. Uh, Adam is going to introduce uh, our speaker for the morning. Uh, he's going to warm things up for us. The Leadership Institute is privileged to have this month's Wake Up Club breakfast speaker, Dr. S. Fred Singer, with us today. Dr. Singer is the founder and president of the Science and Environmental Public, uh, excuse me, Science and Environmental Policy Project a nonprofit policy research group established in 1990. He is internationally known for his work on energy and environmental is issues with a particular expertise in areas such as global climate change, the greenhouse effect, and air pollution. In fact, Dr. Singer was the first scientist to predict that population growth would increase atmospheric methane, an important greenhouse gas. Dr. Singer is also a distinguished research professor at George Mason University and professor emeritus of environmental science at the University of Virginia. Previously, Dr. Singer was the director of the Center for Atmospheric and Space Physics at the University of Maryland from 1953 to 1962. Next, he was the founding dean of the School of Environmental and Planetary Sciences at the University of Miami in 1964. Later, he served as deputy assistant secretary for water quality and research at the Department of Interior. In 1970, he became the Deputy Assistant Administrator for Policy at the Environmental Protection Agency. Then in the late 1980s, before founding SEP, Dr. Singer served as Chief Scientist for the Department of Transportation. Among the many accolades that Dr. Singer has received throughout his professional career, he has been honored with a special commendation from the White House for achievements in the design of artificial Earth satellites. Dr. Singer is the author or editor of more than a dozen books and monographs, including Is There an Optimum Level of Population, Free Market Energy, and Global Climate Change. His latest book, Hot Talk, Cold Science, Global Warming's Unfinished Debate, was published by the Independent Institute in late 1997. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. S. Fred Singer.
Thank you very much. I don't know whether I'll need a microphone. Can you all hear me? Okay, well. If I run out of steam, I'll go, I'll go back to that. I think they're trying to record you over here, however. Are they recording here? Okay. Is it okay? All right. Well, first of all, I'm delighted to be here. I've attended breakfast before, and I'm delighted to have a chance to uh, get reacquainted with all of you. Uh, my topic is uh, one that has become very topical. Let's hear it again. Is that better? Thunderous applause. Hold your applause, please, until the end. <laughs> this subject of uh, climate change has become very topical, particularly because the White House is being attacked over this matter in, without justification, in my view, and I'd like to give you this morning a little background of, of how we got there, uh, what some of the political implications are, uh, talk just a little bit about the science or the absence of science supporting this whole matter, and finally, number three, take a look into the future and try to guess what's going to happen later this week when uh, George W. Bush receives a report from the National Academy of Sciences and is faced with the problem of developing a new policy on this issue in time for the next international conference, which is next week. So you see, we are right in the midst of the process of policy development, and of course any kind of prediction or forecast is very risky. But I'm uh, not risk averse. Besides, there's hardly any way in which I can suffer from this, since it's not really my problem to decide. So I'll go ahead and, and talk about it very freely. Now you might wonder why I divided the subject into three parts. Well, I'll tell you, it's a, it has a historical background. Uh, when I was a boy, uh, I was forced to study Latin. And uh, that was a great hardship on me. And I never understood why I had to do that. But I was told it would improve my thinking. And I remember when I misbehaved, I was forced to memorize the whole first page of the book by Julius Caesar on the Gallic Wars. And I do remember it to this day, because it starts out by explaining that Gaul was divided into three parts. Ever since then, I've divided every talk I give into three parts. <laughs> Just can't help myself. Well, one of the advantages of uh, having been around for a while is that I've seen the subject develop from its very beginning. Thirty years ago, that's a really long time, I organized a little over thirty years ago, thirty-three years ago, I organized perhaps the first conference on the subject, and we called it The Global Effects of Environmental Pollution. And I have a book on this, at, published at that time, to prove it. And we had distinguished people speaking on the subject, wondering what was going to happen to the atmosphere as a result of human activities. And about half the people thought that the atmosphere might warm as a result of the release of greenhouse, so-called greenhouse gases, like carbon dioxide, from the burning of fossil fuels. And the other half of the scientists thought that the climate might get colder, not warmer, but colder, as a result of the burning of fossil fuels. So you see, opinion, scientific opinion was divided at that time, and it still is today. So when you hear a story that there's a scientific consensus, please do not believe it. There is not a scientific consensus. 
there's a great deal of scientific uncertainty. And of course, we scientists love this because it justifies asking for more money for research. And indeed, the amount of money that's being spent on research in this subject is phenomenal. The budget for global climate change research in the Clinton administration, which has just passed, the Clinton-Gore administration, was at the order of $2 billion a year, which is just about the budget of the National Cancer Institute. Now this tells you something about the perverse priorities that the past administration has put on this subject. Because certainly, global climate change, while interesting from a scientific point of view, has very little impact on the way we live. And I will try to justify that a little later in my talk. Be this as it may, those who were concerned about the issue managed to excite the public. And in 1988, in hearings before Senator, then Senator Al Gore, the statement was made that the greenhouse effect was 100, nearly 100% sure and they were enter we were going to enter a period of intense global warming with all sorts of dire consequences. This was amplified by the media and finally resulted in 1992, less than a decade ago, in a conference in Rio de Janeiro at which the Global Climate Treaty was first concluded. It has a fancy name, uh, it's the Framework Convention on Climate Change, but let me call it the, the Global Climate Treaty. And I do remember that we, th many of us thought that the emphasis of this treaty was completely misplaced because we didn't see very much of a problem. It was blown out of proportion. And I remember that the then head of the EPA, Bill Riley, a Republican, um, managed to snooker George Bush Sr. into traveling to Rio de Janeiro to initial the treaty. Big mistake. But George Bush Sr. thought of himself as the environmental president. He was very proud of that, and uh, Riley managed to convince him that he had to do this in order to maintain his reputation as the environmental president. And as a result, we, the United States, ratified this treaty later in 1992, just before uh, Clinton Gore entered the White House. Now, the treaty by itself was just the first step. It didn't require us to do anything. He talked about uh, wonderful things like, you know, watching the atmosphere, being good and kind to animals, and so on. There was nothing very, very offensive in the treaty. But of course, it was only a matter of time before someone wanted to put teeth into it. And that someone turned out to be uh, Albert Gore. And we managed to uh, persuade the world in 1994 six, four years later, that what, in order to satisfy the spirit of the treaty, one had to put teeth into it and require mandatory, that is, mandatory limits on the emission of carbon dioxide, uh, that, which means mandatory limits on the use of energy. Not serious business, because energy is the lifeblood of economic growth, and particularly important for the rest of the world that hasn't yet reached the level of prosperity that we have in the United States. They need lots of energy in order to construct infrastructure, in order to bring up their uh, standard of living for their population. But never mind, by 1997, the next major step was taken in a conference in Kyoto, Japan, and you'll be hearing a lot about this from me later. By the way, it is pronounced Kyoto, although some people call it Kyoto. Uh, you can call it anything you want. It's Kyoto. At this conference, 
the nations assembled, including the United States, with Al Gore present, agreed that we had to reduce our emissions below the level of 1990. In the case of the United States, by 7% below that level. By the year 2010, that is by the end of this decade, well, we're now about 20% above the 1990 level, and by the end of this decade we'll be about 30% above the 1990 level, and reducing energy use by about one-third just isn't in the cards. It just cannot be done. Even the most green environmentalists, if they're realistic, agree with that. Uh, the Council of on, uh, Foreign Relations calls it wildly unrealistic in print. The Resources for the Future says this whole thing makes no sense. Even the Pew Center, another environmental think tank, feels that the targets and timetables cannot be met. Nevertheless, this is what we are about to decide. This is what the international community, particularly the European groups, apparently want, even though they themselves know in their hearts that they cannot meet these targets and timetables. So this is roughly where we stand today. We had the treaty concluded in 1992. We had the Kyoto Conference in 1997. And we're now at the stage of deciding on the nitty-gritties, the details, if you like, of this Kyoto Conference. How are we going to reduce emissions? By taxes, by rationing, or by some other means? When I say other means, there are other means. How did Russia reduce its uh, emissions? Very simply, they scorched their economy. Look at them today. Their emission levels are below 1990. <laughs> How did Germany reduce its emissions? Very simply, they took over East Germany and closed down that part of their economy. So, you know, it can be done. Well, we reduced the emission half the population. That's always an interesting exercise because it requires you to, to choose who are we going to get rid of. Well, let me not get into these uh, messy details. I don't want to be accused of anything, but it, it, let me just say that no one, no one in his right mind believes that we can meet the targets and timetables that are set out in Kyoto. So it is really hypocritical to accuse George Bush of opposing the Kyoto Accord, as he does. And as he stated very clearly in his campaign. Actually, he's not saying anything that's very, very unusual. Because in 1997, the United States Senate, the greatest deliberative body in the world, I guess it still is today, is it? Uh, after the um, upset of yesterday? Anyway, in, 1997, in July 1997, the U.S. Senate voted unanimously on a bipartisan basis, if you like, 95 to nothing, that the United States should have nothing to do with any kind of an agreement like Kyoto. And I suppose they're expressing the will of the people. So why lambast George Bush for something that he's clearly stated in his campaign, something that he was elected on, and something that he intends to carry out? Now there's a fly in the ointment here, and that fly is the following. I'll, I'll be brief about it. In his campaign, he also said that he would put limits or caps on the emissions of carbon dioxide from electric utility plants. To this day, we don't know and we're not sure how this got into his message, his energy message of last September. It was snuck in there by uh, some evil people. We'll find out who they are later. But uh, it clearly makes no sense because it is 
at variance with his announced intention to oppose the Kyoto Treaty. Once this was pointed out to him after his election, he said he's not going to put limits on carbon dioxide anymore. And that, of course, is being held against him now. As a matter of fact, the White House is under tremendous attack, not only from internal groups, that is, from environmental groups in the United States, and from partisan groups on the uh, opposite side of the aisle, but also from abroad. The Europeans, the European community, and the European countries that have signed on to Kyoto are lambasting the White House for opposing Kyoto. Now just look at the hypocrisy involved here. None of those countries, none of those countries has ratified the Kyoto Accord. None of them. The only country in Europe that has ratified the Kyoto Accord is Romania. <laughs> they're, not, they're not even covered by this. They don't have to do anything. So they can ratify the, the accord without any penalty. I've not discussed the matter with any Romanians. In fact, I don't know any Romanians. If you do, please do ask them about it. But uh, also it has been ratified by Mauritius, the Seychelles Islands, and the Marshall Islands. Other great, great international movers. Yes. None of those countries have to do anything because the only nations that are required to obey the Kyoto Accord and reduce their energy use are the developed industrialized nations. China, India, Mexico, Brazil, they go off scot-free. So you can see immediately what will happen if perchance we were to be foolish enough to go along with Kyoto. Our industries would move to China, India, Mexico, and Brazil. Why? Because energy use there would not be limited. So manufacturing, which requires energy use, would move overseas. <coughs> which is why, quite sensibly, most of the labor unions in this country oppose the Kyoto Accord. Naturally, the United Mine Workers are against it, but also the Teamsters and some of the others. This hasn't been widely recognized, but uh, I think in the White House, the people who are concerned with politics are probably aware of it. They need to make better use of this information. Having given you some of the history, let me say just a few words about the science. Since I'm a scientist, I have to talk about this. I'll make it very brief. To help you along on this, I've uh, put on your uh, table here a letter that of mine that was published in Science, which is a journal called Science, about a month ago, which lays it all out in half a page. I must tell you, it's quite a coup to get something like this published in science because they've taken a politically correct view and took me quite a lot of effort to persuade them to publish this letter, which takes issue with an editorial of the editor-in-chief of science. You see the problem there. The editor-in-chief is a uh, former operator in the Democratic administration, um, a convinced uh, environmentalist. What more can I say about him? He wrote a, a scandalous editorial exhibiting his bias. Uh, he shouldn't do this as the editor of this journal, which is, a res is or used to be a respected journal. So I'm delighted that I had a chance to contradict him. I'm also delighted that there's a second letter in there, which unfortunately got cut off, uh, where the author, who Jim Johnston of the American Enterprise Institute takes issue with the editor for taking a partisan position on the 
Kyoto Accord. He says, Science Magazine shouldn't be doing this. Well, to summarize the science, in a nutshell, there hasn't been any warming of the atmosphere in the last 60 years. The overwhelming, overwhelming amount of data, and this is referenced here, show no warming since 1940. No warming trend. Of course, the climate is warming and cooling all the time. It fluctuates from year to year. But there has been no general trend, no upward trend. As you might expect from the theory. So we have a simple, simple problem. Should we believe in the atmosphere or should we believe in the theory? Well, half the scientists believe in the atmosphere, and I do too, and half the scientists believe in the theory. Those who believe in the theory says the atmosphere should be warming because that's what the theory says. Well, I, I know if you work on theory, that's the point of view, is there must be something wrong with the measurements. And those of you, us who believe in the atmosphere say there must be something wrong with the theory. But look, I'm not going to involve you in this debate because that's not your business. But I think it'll get straightened out sooner or later. We're going to be, keep observing the atmosphere for the next 10 years or 20 years, and we'll see whether it warms or not. My prediction is the warming will be insignificant. Sure, the theory says it should be warming, but the amount of warming may be so small, and I believe is so small, that it is nearly undetectable, and therefore of no significance whatsoever, and therefore not worth bothering about from a policy point of view. That's it in a nutshell. All of the evidence that people have pointed to, like the melting of glaciers, the melting of the ice, the rising of sea level, and so on, those observations are okay. But they have nothing to do with a current warming. That's all a consequence of the earlier warming before 1940, which is of natural origin. And the reason we're seeing all these things is because ice doesn't melt immediately. You try it out. Put some ice in your glass, and it'll stay around for a while. It won't melt immediately. And the same is true with glaciers, sea ice, ice in the Antarctic and anywhere else. It takes a long, long time for the ice to melt. Well, without going into further science, let me just summarize that part of it by saying, yes, the theory says it should be warming, no, the amount of warming that the theory predicts is probably wrong. It is a lot less, and therefore of no consequence. Finally, just a few words about the future. The future is this week and next week. That's a very, very immediate future. Uh, I'm personally involved in this, so I'm delighted to talk to you about this. First of all, the White House has been persuaded by, the, by, basically by us, because we've been objecting to the United Nations scientific report, which is biased and inaccurate, and has asked, the White House has asked the National Academy of Sciences to conduct an independent review of the underlying science. It's a panel of 11 people, 10 men, one woman. They're all very good. They're all reasonably, reasonably expert. I have no problem with that. Unfortunately, only one of these 11 is a skeptic on this issue. The other 10 are pretty much agreed that the global warming is a problem. Now, I have no way of knowing how this will turn out but tomorrow, we will know, because today, later today, the Academy turns in its report to the White House, and tomorrow it'll be on the web, and we'll be reading about it. And since they undoubtedly have press releases going out this morning, it'll be in the papers tomorrow. And I have no idea what it will say, but I'm hoping that our one guy on this panel who's very, very good, will hold his own against the 10, and that they will come out with a report saying that the issue is cloudy, 
and not sure. Now let me tell you frankly that we have one thing going for us. And that is they will say that there are tremendous uncertainties. We know that because that is the way you justify getting more money for research. <laughs> <laughs> tremendous uncertainties. We need to have more money for research. Otherwise, you know, we won't be able to solve these uncertainties. And these, these are all good scientists with university positions mainly who are relying on government funding for their research. That's what they'll say. But I don't know what they'll say about action programs. We'll see. By the end of this week, we hope to have an analysis of this Academy report ready to be published on the web. And those of you who follow this by looking at our website, which I will give you in a minute, will be able to read it. Our website is www SEPP, which stands for Science Environmental Policy Project, dot org. Work. Very simple. So that's one thing that's going to happen this week and perhaps next week on the scientific front. On June 14, which is just a week from tomorrow, the leaders of the uh, European nations and George Bush will be meeting in Göteborg in Sweden to talk about this. And they'll be meeting again in July in Genoa to talk about this. And they'll be meeting again in Bonn in July to talk about this. So you know, they go on talking about this all the time. But the real decisions, I think, will be made in July in Italy. And thereby hangs a story. And the story is the following. Three weeks ago, I was asked to come to New York and uh, conduct, help conduct a briefing for the Italian Ministry of the Environment. And the Director General of that ministry, who was a, a medical doctor and a reasonably well-regarded scientist himself, wanted to be briefed on this issue to get different points of view about global warming science. That's always a good sign. It means that he's not committed to any point of view. He's open. And then we found out, after I briefed him, and others uh, briefed him on the other side, why he's interested. He's interested because the Italian government has changed. And the socialists are out, and Berlusconi is in. And Berlusconi has said publicly that he's against the Kyoto Protocol because it will damage the Italian economy. And the other thing he said is that he'll support George Bush because he wants Italy to be America's most important ally in Europe. Now, <laughs> on June 2nd, which is last Saturday, La Stampa which is a leading Italian newspaper in Torino, published the following, and it's on my website, if you can, re you can read it, in, in English, translated. It published a, uh, an angry denial by the outgoing Minister of the Environment for Italy, denying the rumor that Italy is going to abandon the Kyoto Protocol. That's a very good sign. That's a very good sign. So my hope is, that when George Bush meets Berlusconi, that Berlusconi will do what Margaret Thatcher did to George Bush Sr. when she said to him, George, this is no time to be wobbly. <laughs> Thank you very much. Anybody have a question for Dr. Singer? Yes, uh, Dr. Singer, as you know, there's a tremendous pressure right within George W. Bush's own administration for him to try to go the, to try to push him in the opposite direction of this. Uh, Christy Whitman, who uh, many George Bush uh, loyalists nicknamed Brownie after Carol Browner, uh, is being goaded 
by some of the holdover bureaucrats there from the Clinton administration, and they're pushing hard. I have to believe that anybody who tracks this day in and day out as you do must have some idea as to what's going on there and what are the prospects. I don't know whether you heard the discussion, but uh, there's pressure on George Bush right within the administration from holdovers and from some of the new appointees. I'm sorry to say that the Bush administration has actually hired people into the White House who are affiliated directly with environmental organizations that are promoting the global warming issue. Um, they're working very, very hard to get Bush to change his mind. Unfortunately, of course, these decisions are made on a political basis. <clears throat> and ultimately, the uh, people in charge of the political shop in the White House will advise George Bush on his options. In the meantime, those of us who regard the global warming issue as essentially a scientific fraud are pushing very hard on the other side. With some help from uh, such unlikely allies as labor unions and others who see a tremendous economic threat to the United States and to their livelihood. So the political situation is very much up in the air. Again, my hope is that the defection of Italy from the uh, United European Front will be something that will buck up the White House and will put some steel into their spine and allow them to continue opposing the Kyoto Protocol, as they should. They do have to come up with an alternative. They are required pretty much to present a plan. My best guess is that this will be a plan that relies on voluntary targets, voluntary efforts to increase energy efficiency and conservation. There's nothing wrong with that. The voluntary plan is the way to go. And energy efficiency by itself is a good thing provided it makes economic sense. Let me put it to you this way. Obviously, if we can use less energy and achieve the same result, we can save money, not only in the household, but also in industry. The question always is how far to go. I have a car that gets 24 miles to the gallon. It's fairly new. Should I throw it out? junk it and get a car that gets 30 miles to the gallon? Obviously no. This is the kind of reasoning you have to use. Should I tear down my house because I can get a new house constructed that has better heat insulation? No. You cannot destroy capital equipment because to rebuild the same capital equipment requires even more energy. And you have to look at the whole picture. The easiest way to judge whether energy conservation or, and energy efficiency makes sense is to ask, can I get a payback from energy savings in a reasonable length of time? What's a reasonable length of time? Well, it depends on your point of view, but most people would say between three and five years. If I get a payback in less than three years, yes, I should do it. That's why many people are going to energy efficient light bulbs which are costly, but which do save electric power. And if electric power is expensive, as it now is becoming in some areas, it pays to do that. On the other hand, if the payback is more than 10 years, probably not worth doing. So these are the kinds of considerations that have to go into the voluntary plan. And you'll find that George Bush will also come up with a lot of goodies for those who believe in alternative energy. And you know, alternative energy, uh, the best alternative energy one can think of is nuclear energy. Because it emits no carbon dioxide, it has no greenhouse effect, it is safe, it is cleaner than any than coal, 
And the, the problems that are assigned to nuclear energy are most, mostly imaginary, not real. So it is the best way to go, but one needs to convince people of this. When it comes to solar energy, sure, it has its place. I have a wristwatch that works on solar energy. It's a great idea for a wristwatch, but it doesn't work for a house. It requires every family to have roughly a football field full of solar cells. That's rather expensive. And who's going to sweep it every day? Get the leaves off. You know, it, the, are the birds, are they going to pay attention? Uh, no, they never do. And birds. And then they fly into windmills and get themselves chewed up. So you see, that's the real problem, birds. <laughs> There's nothing that George Bush can do about this. Max? Yes. Uh, Sorry. Dr. Sager, I spent uh, my career working with the energy side. And uh, supplies energy to the state of California. Mm -hmm. Would you not say, and this is sort of a rhetorical question, What's going on in California today may not be a microcosm of the political consequences of depriving a population of energy. I've been asked to comment on the situation in California. Uh, I think you all know what, what caused the problems in California. It was a uh, political attempt to do what, what is called partial deregulation. You deregulated the supply, but you managed to keep price caps on the demand so that uh, you kept the uh, price to the consumer artificially low so that there was no incentive to conserve. And obviously, if supply and demand don't match, uh, eventually you have a problem. There's been no significant building of power plants in California in the last 20 years. Uh, there's uh, been no significant addition to transmission lines. So if one part of California has enough electric power, they cannot send it, let's say, from Los Angeles to San Francisco. Well, these things have been well, well explained. But what is happening in California is you're seeing, in effect, a rationing scheme. It's called rolling blackouts. Rationing is what you have to do if you want to limit the amount of energy. You can do it in one of two ways. You can actually ration it is you can cut the use and assign uh, uh, permits to people and decide who is going to get energy and who isn't. Or you can do it by the price mechanism. You can raise the price until only those who can afford it can buy the energy. There's no other way, either by price or by rationing. And the California situation is a good illustration of what you would run into if we were to try to enforce the Kyoto Protocol here in the United States. The worst part, of course, of all of this is that the enforcement would not just be done by the United States, let's say by the EPA, but by some international body of inspectors, accountants, lawyers, and so on, who are not accountable to the American public, who are not elected, who are not responsible. And that, of course, is the worst part of any treaty like Kyoto, any such international agreement, which is precisely the reason why some misguided people support it, because they feel that Kyoto would be a step in the right direction towards a type of world government. Well, all I have to say to them is take a look at the European Union, or the European Commission rather, and see how they're conducting their business in Europe, and ask Europeans individual Europeans if they're happy about this situation of having bureaucrats in Brussels decide for them what's good for them. Yes, sir. Uh, Fred, the, the friends of Kyoto have done a marvelous job of marketing their the benefits, presumed benefits of the uh, climate change. And one of them is that, of course, that there would be necess by necessity of massive transfer of resources Developed countries to developing countries in the purchase of permits and 
another thing that he's done. So that you, there's a very large group of people in the development community who believe that this is a marvelous thing because it would force the United States and other countries to indeed be more generous in terms of their economic assistance to, fight, uh, you know, to, to deal with some of the pressing global problems you described the HIV age, you talk about global hunger, global poverty, and things of this kind. So in, in my opinion, and it's opinion, that if the United States were to be more generous for coming and, some, and tackling some of the global problems which are real, like air pollution in urban cities overseas, uh, like uh, food security, etc., we probably could help offset part of that argument. Uh, the question asked, or the comment made, was that one of the driving forces behind Kyoto is the desire to transfer resources, that is money, from industrialized nations, from developed nations, to non-industrialized nations. That is absolutely correct. This is a part of the uh, scheme that's been going on now for decades. Uh, it is called the New International Economic Order. And uh, it's something that, that uh, the uh, less developed nations have been trying to institutionalize. Uh, cynics refer to it as a scheme of transferring money from the poor in the rich countries to the rich in the poor countries, which is basically what it is, because the money doesn't trickle down in those nations. It stays with the rulers who deposit it in Swiss bank accounts and other places. It's been documented so many times that I don't see how we can overlook it. The, uh, there still there are people who believe in it, and they see uh, the Kyoto Accord as another way of reaching that goal of, of transferring funds. Uh, it is sad because it really does hurt uh, the lower income groups in the United States because this is tax money. And if it's money that's spent for energy, it is even worse because it, it is re a very regressive tax, a very regressive tax that hits hardest on people who have the lowest incomes. Yes, please. Yes, sir. But sponsor Congress to design the complete supply of our fittest. If we believe that, and if we believe that that atomic uh, energy is the best way and very safe and most efficient way to uh, produce electricity, especially for third world, you cannot uh, adopt very expensive methodology to produce electricity for their country. Why should we stop country like India and Pakistan? The question is, why should we stop, stop India and Pakistan? Like India and Pakistan to pursue their economic energy plan, to, you know, provide their yeah. citizens yeah. cheap electricity. Well, as far as I know, nobody is stopping India and Pakistan from developing atomic energy for uh, power generation. India has gone a long way to produce electric power plants. Uh, I'm not sure about Pakistan, but uh, it turns out that in order to justify uh, atomic energy, power plants, uh, you need to have a reasonably good electric grid, you have to be able, which can absorb uh, a power plant of the order of uh, 500 to 1,000 megawatts, uh, which means that you have to, it really makes sense only in a, a reasonably industrialized country. Um, but, but nobody, as far as I know, is, is stopping uh, people from developing a nuclear power for peaceful purposes. In fact, uh, we have uh, industries more than delighted to sell nuclear reactors to anybody who wants to buy them. Uh, the problem is to persuade populations in certain countries to adopt, uh, agree to nuclear energy. In this respect, I think, European countries are probably uh, most to blame because, for example, in Austria, <laughs> they built a nuclear plant and then they had a referendum and they never opened it up. It just sits there. It's a great museum. 
tremendous investment. They even had the fuel there. They never turned it on. In Germany, they're thinking of, or they think they have a law that says we, to get rid of all nuclear plants within the next two decades. In Sweden, they've actually closed down an operating nuclear plant. Okay, let them freeze in the dark, and then we'll see what happens. <laughs> Oh, well, I think they have a mistaken idea that uh, nuclear power plants can be used to manufacture weapons. That's nonsense. If you want to manufacture a nuclear weapon, uh, you build a special reactor to make a weapon material, or you steal it. That both things are going on at the same time, unfortunately. One more question, sir. You comment on the satellite readings of the temperature of the Earth. Well, I'm going back to a, to a scientific point here. Um, I happen to be partial to satellites because of my own personal experience. But irrespective of this, uh, the only decent global data we have, truly global data, come from Earth satellites. And the Earth satellites show that during their whole period of operation, which is now 22 years, there has been no warming trend in the atmosphere, in the global atmosphere. And I think those data are probably more nearly correct than some of the surface data, which are subject to all kinds of uh, interferences and errors. Before I finish, I would just like to tell you I have brought with me some material that I can hand out, if you will, from here. And also, I brought along a copy of the book and uh, report, uh, which unfortunately we cannot give away, but if you would like to have it, I'd be happy to uh, have you contribute to the Science and Environmental Policy Project. Thank you. On behalf of the Leadership Institute, I want to thank uh, this man of science for sharing uh, his knowledge with us. Uh, we want to give him a memento, a reminder of the father of the science of economics, and we hope that he'll wear it when Governor Davis sees fit to, you know, to seek his advice. On the <laughs> darkness in the country. I'm delighted to have uh, a, a, a blue tie to join my red one. Thank you. Thank you very much. I want to uh, I want to remind you that we will have no wake up uh, club breakfast on the first Wednesday in July. Uh, it has nothing to do with our concern about all the carbon dioxide that you're emitting. Uh, it has everything to do with this pork project that we have going on Ju July the fourth at Fort Hunt Park. Instead, you may come here on July the 11th.